pulled all the troops back in that three-story house that had a rock wall around the outside. We was getting so low on ammunition, we was only shooting when they'd try to come over that wall. So they turned a bazooka loose. With the United States' involvement in the Second World War increasing rapidly, American businesses shifted their peacetime productions to support the Allied war effort. Folks like George Mills of Decatur, Alabama, did their part on the home front. But before long, George heard that Uncle Sam was about to call his name. The draft board was across the street from where I worked, and uh, I knew the young lady who worked in there. And she uh, stuck her head out the window and said, George, you're gonna be drafted next Wednesday. So I had two guys that was buddies of mine and they were in the same boat. So we just decided with it, we'd three go down and enlist. They processed us to the act Fort McClellan and uh, they sent me to Livingston, Louisiana for basic training. George was assigned to the U.S. Army's 28th Infantry Division and soon began training for the Allied Forces next major offensive in the war against Germany the invasion of Western Europe. And then went to Carabao, Florida, and we took amphibious training there. Then we left there and went to uh, Pickett, Virginia for cliff scaling. Then from there to England. Having been held back during the initial D-Day landings, the 28th Division landed on the shores of Normandy in July of 1944. With the beaches secure, George and the 28th moved inland, engaging the enemy almost immediately. After a month of combat, slowly pushing the German forces back from one town to another, the 28th Division walked into the newly liberated city of Paris. When we did uh, liberate Paris, the Chantilly Boulevard, it's a big wide street. That's where they wanted to have the parade and have the uh, viewing stands and all for the officers. And we marched 24 abreast from, from the Arc de Triomphe to Notre Dame Church. Although the liberation of Paris brought the Allies one step closer to victory, the end of the war was not as near as it seemed. The next objective would take George and the 28th Division into German territory. Then we went into the Hurken Forest. When we attacked in that thing, the artillery would hit the trees. It would tear the top of the trees up and all that would fall. For nearly three months, the United States Army launched assault after assault against the German forces, but to little avail. The Battle of the Hurtgen Forest claimed over 30,000 American casualties. It was just so bad in there that uh, it took two or three days to get the wounded out because you couldn't get vehicles in there. And after the the, we fought in the Hurricane Forest there. They pulled us out of there and took us to Dykirk, Luxembourg. The 28th Division was pulled back from the front lines to regroup. But soon, Germany would launch their largest offensive since the Allies set foot in Europe, taking their enemies completely by surprise. And then they sent us up to a little town called Walls. That's where our supplies and kitchen was set up, and uh, we really had a good meal, boy. And it's just like here. I mean, nothing going on. It was just peaceful as it could be. I went down with a Jeep, and uh, I just decided to spend the night, the 15th of December, 44. I went to bed that night in a little old rock barn there. And I woke up at 5 o'clock, and artillery and rockets was coming in. 
man. I mean, all around that place, it was just hundreds of them. I said, boy, I got to get back to the company. How they get the hit up there? So I jumped on that Jeep, went back up with them, and sure enough, 5th Panzer Division, they were coming around our left flank. Vanguard Division was coming around our right flank and surrounded that 200 men. Called G Company, they couldn't help us. They just told us to hold that road. So we pulled all the troops back in that three-story house that had a rock wall around the outside. We was getting so low on ammunition, we was only shooting when they'd try to come over that wall. So they turned a bazooka loose and uh, blew a one hole in it. I went back there to see what was going on. They turned another round in there and I got some shrapnel from that. Then they turned the flamethrower in there and said, don't fire. Surrounded, low on ammunition, and having suffered many casualties, George and the rest of his company were now prisoners of war. In the hands of the enemy, there was no way of knowing what lie ahead. And, and then we went from there to Stilager 4B where they segregated us. They took all the officers and put them in concentration camps. Took all the privates and uh, put them in work farms or businesses, whatever, wherever they needed them. They took all the NCOs and they started us marching towards Czechoslovakia. For five months, George and the other captured NCOs were gradually marched across Europe. Though starved and exhausted, George never gave up hope. We walked all the way to Stilager 8A, which is on Czechoslovakian border. They'd put us in a barn lot. That was down to about 250 of us at that time. We were there two nights. Then we, uh, we could hear Russian artillery coming in. I heard a, a tank, and I, I thought it was a German tank, and I kept looking for it. When I did spot it, it was a half-track, and uh, then it was a command car with it, big old white star on the side of it, which is American, you know. We took over the guards who was there, and they sent trucks in there and picked us up, trucked us back to La Havre, France, and getting us clean clothes and getting us something to eat and uh, putting us on boats to send us back home. Soon after the liberation, the war in Europe came to an end, and George was heading back to Alabama. Throngs of war-weary servicemen returned from overseas, and their families were eagerly waiting. My mother, she'd been getting letter telegrams from from the government missing in action. When you know, missing in action, they don't tell you nothing except missing in action. When we went to Stilager 4B, they gave us a little old card, said we could send that home. Wrote on there, I was doing fine, and uh, I told her to send me some candy and some socks. <laughs> and uh, she got that card. I come in home, knocked on the door, and they were back back of the house cooking breakfast. And uh, Elizabeth come to the door and the screen door was hooked. She got so excited she did, didn't unhook the door and let me in. She run back to tell them and uh, and then they all come out there. So I went back and of course that's cooking breakfast and I was glad to get that, you know. So they was glad to see me. To this day, George Mills continues to be an influential voice, pointing us to the importance of remembering the past. I, I go to not as many right now as I used to, and I still do uh, some church, meet with church groups. And I do a toast of the flag. And if you don't remember your history, you, you can't do your tomorrow's work.
Hi everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you for watching this episode. Our goal is to capture as many World War II veteran stories as we can from all over the world, but we can't do it alone. If you'd like to help us in this mission, consider supporting us through Patreon and check out our website, memoirsofworldwar2.com for more information. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Again, we want to thank you for your support and thanks for watching.